So welcome back to Evola Day. In this video, I'm going to be looking at the key influences uh, on Evola and his work. I have narrowed it down to uh, 10 people who, according to scholars, uh, critics, and indeed Evola himself, uh, influenced him more than uh, anyone else. I should say that uh, in making this video, I found the introduction to Men Among the Ruins, written by Dr. H.D. Hansen, uh, very useful. I also uh, used Guido Stucco's The Legacy of European Traditionalist Julius Evola in Perspective, uh, which, which is a very uh, useful introduction to his work, uh, as well as Franco Ferraresi's uh, essay, Judas Avila, Tradition, Reaction, and the Radical Right. René Guénon was probably the biggest influence on Avila's thought and was responsible for a major shift in his thinking, which led him to becoming a lifelong perennial traditionalist. Guénon's book, The Crisis of the Modern World, written in 1927, strongly influenced Evola's own Revolt Against the Modern World, which was published in 1934. Through Guénon, Evola also found his way to Eastern traditions. Guénon's influence on Evola was such that he was even called the Italian Guénon by some. However, while they agreed on much, Guénon and Evola did not agree on everything, but I do not have space to get into that here. Uh, we'll probably discuss that a little bit later on uh, in some of the longer discussions uh, that we'll be having on Evola uh, this evening. They kept a long personal correspondence through letters from 1930 until Guénon died in 1951. However, Evola had written to Guénon as early as 1925, and we have uh, letters from Guénon to Guido di Giorgio commenting that he was very young and didn't quite understand his book East and West. But nonetheless, Guénon saw potential in the young Evola. He liked his spirit. Uh, the relationship between Guénon and Evola seems very much like that of master and apprentice. Even when Evola was much older, uh, you still get this tone uh, in the letters. After he died, Evola wrote a 30-page piece called René Guénon, A Teacher for Modern Times. Now, the second uh, influence, somewhat uh, hidden, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning, is Johann Jakob Bakkefen who was a 19th century mythological scholar uh, he, from Switzerland who greatly informed uh, Evola's anthropological and mythical lexicon as well as the morphology of traditional societies. Evola even translated some of Bakkefen's works into Italian. Third, Frederick Nietzsche is a constant presence in Evola's work, both as an influence and also as a kind of perpetual antagonist. Evola agrees with much of Nietzsche's analysis of modernity, including the idea that God is dead, that the West has lost its animating spirit, and that it has taken on a slave morality. And that, because of all of these things, we face an existential nihilism, However, where Nietzsche succumbs to naturalism and ultimately to uh, nihilism, Evola sees a search for the transcendent as the answer, and much of his work can be seen as a positive response to the challenge posed by Nietzsche. Fourth influence that uh, people detect, and you can see it right through uh, Revolt Against the Modern World, is Oswald Spengler. He was especially influential on Evola's view of cyclical history and in his view that civilization declines when the economic gains the upper hand in culture and as a result decadence becomes deep set. Evola translated the entirety 
of decline of the West into Italian, which is no mean feat, and became convinced by Spengler that Western civilization was doomed and needed to collapse before rebirth was possible. However, as with Nietzsche, he was critical of Spengler's naturalism and his lack of transcendent values. A fifth influence on Evola was Otto Weininger, who was a Jewish philosopher from Austria, who wrote a book called Sex and Character, which profoundly influenced Evola's view on gender roles. Evola's Eros and the Mysteries of Love can almost be seen as a book-length response and critique of Weininger's work. Weininger, despite being Jewish, also had a negative view of what he calls Jewishness, which he saw as a kind of disposition or spirit. Uh, incidentally, Weininger clearly had uh, some issues because he committed suicide. Evola uh, obviously thought highly enough of Weininger to translate his work into Italian, and uh, I believe for a long time uh, Evola's translation of Weininger's work was seen as the kind of gold standard uh, in Italy. A sixth influence, Meister Eckhart. Who was that? A German theologian during the late 13th and early 14th centuries who was a, a Neoplatonist. Uh, in fact, um, apparently he was tried for heresy by the Pope at the time, uh, but he died before the verdict was reached. Now, uh, Eckhart has been described by some as a mystic, uh, by Carl Jung as a Gnostic, although it seems like the jury is out on both of those labels. Evola quotes him all through his works, and from him takes his fundamental concept of freedom in the absolute self, to act without looking towards success or failure, as well as a total aversion to sentimentality. 7. Plato strongly influences both Evola's metaphysics in the distinction between the profane empirical world and the ideal world of forms and his views on democracy. In The Republic, Plato says, look down always with their heads bent to the ground like cattle. At the banquet, tables they feed, fatten and fornicate. To get their fill of such things, they kick and butt each other with iron horns and hoofs and kill each other. They are insatiable as they do not fill the real and continent part of themselves with true realities. And this is also essentially Evola's view. Number eight, Gustave Le Bon, and especially his masterpiece, The Crowd, underlined Evola's dim view of the masses as being essentially feminine and incapable of understanding higher ideals. This also underpinned his absolute opposition to democracy. A ninth influence is Joseph de Maistre, a key counter-enlightenment thinker, who Evola quotes fairly frequently and always with approval. De Maistre believed that a power and authority that are not absolute are neither power nor authority. And tenth, finally, Vilfredo Pareto. Although Evola did not agree with Pareto's economics, uh, he cites him frequently in his works, as well as, although it must be said less frequently, his fellow elite theorist Giantano Mosca. Evola seems to have appreciated Pareto's laser-like puncturing of the myths of liberalism, uh, humanitarianism, and of course democracy, as well as his clear-eyed view of both the Roman and medieval eras. All right, we'll end things there. Hope you're enjoying Evola Day. There'll be a third video along the way soon and much, much more after that. There's going to be about eight, eight hours plus of content today. I hope you stick with us. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle 
through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.